Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, I see that some people are still connecting to audio and we're expecting a few more people to be joining us. Um, so I'm just really, I'm just pausing so that everyone can connect and things like that. But if you don't know who I am, hello, everyone. My name is Charlotte Mukan. I'm the director of the Pelham Arts Center. And I just want to say welcome and thank you so much for joining us in our virtual space today. Uh, we've been doing exactly. virtual studio visits for the last few weeks and I am loving them because it's such a great way to connect with an artist, find out about their journey, their purpose, what they've been through. Um, and it's, I've learned so much and I hope that you'll be able to enjoy it as well today. Um, I'd like to go over a couple housekeeping items before we go visit Arlene live in her studio. Um, Yes, you can use the chat feature if you have questions or comments, and we, I will make sure that those questions are addressed. I'd like to ask that everyone stays on mute while, we, um, while we're doing the studio visit, um, especially if you have something like a barking dog or a vacuum or whatever. Um, use the chat box, and at the end, we will turn it more into a question and answer where people can unmute themselves and ask specific questions about a body of work or a particular process or whatever that might be like. Um, so welcome, thank you everyone. Um, I'm so happy to see some familiar faces here and it's a real, real joy. I am going to now spotlight Arlene and we're gonna go right to her studio. So thank you, Arlene Rush. Hi. <laughs> So I, I first want to thank everybody for coming. Um, this means a lot to me, being in this pandemic, feeling so isolated, having you come and join me here and having Charlotte, who I know for many years, ask me to do this. It's, it's really a heartwarming, so thank you so much. So um, welcome everybody. Uh, this is my studio and I've been here uh, over 25 years. Um, I'm going to take you around to the work that I've been doing and uh, talk a little bit about the work and also the pandemic, how it's affected my art and so on and so forth. So um, first of all, this uh, very small, uh, from a big installation in Rope, uh called Where Liberty Dwells. And uh, this work falls under my current affairs series. And my current affair, affair series is running and running since, I would say, it actually started in 2008, but I really focused on it in 2016 with the election. So this is where Liberty dwells, and we did this installation with the cradle boards on the wall for uh, spring break and of the show in excess, uh, which was not, uh, was waitlisted, but it did not happen. So um, we were doing this setup of an installation that I would say would be around nine feet by 12 feet. And there's around 16 cradle boards and there's around, there's 19 uh, cushions uh, representing the 19th amendment. So um, I'm reflecting on where Liberty dwells. In my, Current Affairs series. This is an earlier piece, which was 2016, and I was actually thinking about it today. It's called America uh, 2018. And if you look closely, you can see over here, it says America fading out. And there's drips of resin on it. And it's, uh, this is a bunting morning flag. And it's unfortunately, uh, really reminiscent of what we're going through right now. Our country is dying. Uh, our political system, it's all very, very sad. And uh, this piece represents the loss of our freedom and liberty that we, as a country, uh, you know, really marked ourselves as having. Uh, this is Hope for World Peace. And I did this first show uh, that was last summer, which is now quite saddening because 
it was at Plaxel Gallery, and I'm I was supposed to be showing again this year at Plaxel uh, in March for Women's History Month, and that show was uh, curated by Lisa. Uh, let me make sure I say her last name right. I'm very bad with this. Uh, uh, D Donato, and that has been put on hold. And that show is called "Someone Will Remember Us Even in Different Times," and I will show you the piece I did for that. During the pandemic, um, when it started, I was pretty frozen, and um, which is very unusual for me because I'm quite prolific in work, um, and I really felt doing art, doing anything was not important. What was important was other people and how could I help other people. Though I did feel it was very important to mark mark this in history, and. Uh, so future generations will not forget about it. So I started marking my rolls of the cardboard and toilet paper and uh, marking the weeks that I used it. And this will be an installation that will be ongoing, but I also have, it's not that, and I also have another piece that I'll be doing from that that I'll be doing some casts of and using the dates that are recorded here. This is also part of my series, uh, Current Affairs. And I did this piece probably in uh, 2019. And it's called, Is That All There Is? And it's really the patriarchy of our political system. And it's small, it's small minded men. And um, moving along here, this is both. And this is a skull, it's very subtle, but you can see the little babies curling up in the unicorn where there is some hope. And it's about voting and, you know, our country, what it's about and the money flowing over and the evil skull um, and the pig. Yes, the pig is very important. So um, moving along here, the piece, uh, the show that was put on hold that might still happen this summer at Plaxel Gallery. Uh, I did this piece um, called, uh, what's the name of the piece? All right, I don't remember the name of the piece. Um, I thought I wrote it down here. Well, oh, Not Forever. You no, know, that's not called Not Forever. Um, well, Charlotte, do you know the name of this piece? Do you have it oh, from uh, my website? I'm like blanking out now. No? Oh, God. Well, this work um, is really about the, you know, the underpinning of society and how they see uh, aging and imperfections. And it's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, and how, um, you know, what is beauty, what is aging, what is per impermanence? And in Japan, they fit, when ceramic pieces break, they fill it with uh, gold and lacquer and they mix it and they put it into the cracks and they put it back together again. And, and that is considered something very beautiful. So it's like the veins, the wrinkles, the crinkliness of our skin, the beauty of that is demonstrated here. And it's very bodily. Moving along to more work over here, uh, oh yes, and this is from the Me, you know, the Me Too. This I did, I think, 2019. Also, the Me Too era and uh, Do Not Touch, representing what the president. So that could have been in two, but actually before 2019, it could have been 2018. So um, this piece of declaration was done, and here I'm using myself. And some of you might know I use myself in my work, uh, one, I'm readily available, and two, if I'm going to strip down certain things from a human being, I might as well do it for myself. And I also am a twin, so that uh, twin to a, a boy, and I have a twin brother. So some of that is uh, reflective in my work, and it definitely is a springboard in my work to dealing with identity. Um, and I grew up in a very unusual household because I had the best of both worlds in terms of being a female and being able to do male things. I was a tomboy. And uh, 
So I meld the two genders together because we can be everybody. And instead of separating ourselves with, even though we are unique and uniqueness is great and that's what makes life interesting, there is a common denominator about us all being human beings. And we forget that. And uh, all the isms are about us not being equal. And I'm looking at how we could connect ourselves, uh, each other, to an us and a we instead of a them and an I. So that, a lot of that is in the work and that's where I'm using my heads on a male and a female. Over here is uh, America and um, it's somewhat self-explanatory. They earn like uh, job, uh, shakers with shredded dollar bills on this luxurious colors of the flag uh, velvet. And um, the tops are tilted. They're about to either fall off, explode, or it's just uh, representing how we as a country need to do something different uh, because we're, it's not working. You know, there is no perfection here at all. And it's all about capitalism and uh, greed and money. And it's interesting because like when you think about this pandemic, so much about um, this at the beginning had to do with people being older and the lack of worth in older people's lives. How we see, how society sees that in this country is quite, um, it's quite saddening and, and it's shameful actually. So this piece over here is early work and it's called Fear. And it's quite uh, interesting having it uh, uh, present at the moment because I think fear is what is underlying everybody uh, at the moment. And uh, I moved into this series of using my head, stripping it to an androgynous form of a human being, stripping it down, taking away all the egocentric parts like my hair and my eye, you know, my eyelashes, things that kind of uh, separate me from others and things that I also hold on tightly to uh, as a woman and uh, what I think society might even uh, admire. So uh, this is all stripped down. And this came out of uh, a period uh, where I was moving into conceptual work from being an abstract sculptor, making big life-size, uh, over life-size, big outdoor uh, steel work, and, which was very unusual because I started doing that in 1986. Uh, and I, um, not that many women were working in steel, so a lot of my male friends, artist friends, a lot of my artist friends were males, and we used to go to steel yards and stuff like that. And, um, but then I eventually met some women artists that were also doing it. But that work wasn't expressing what I really wanted to talk about, and I wanted to talk about concepts, and my work moved into the conceptual form, and that's where it's been and is, and probably will be until I die, but you never know. Um, Arlene, oh, before, Arlene, I'm sorry, before you move on to the next piece, yeah. I'm not sure if people are able to read the words on the back of that head. Can you? Oh, so it says fear, and across it says fear is down, and across it says false evidence. Uh, maybe if you could back up a little, it might be clearer. I don't know. Uh, false evidence appearing real. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry about that. Um, so let's see. I could move you into. Uh, I've also done. We'll go over here some performance pieces and interactive pieces. And uh, this was I did actually for a show in, at Rush Gallery, uh, along with my first political piece that Derek Adams perform did the performance for within the gallery for me. But this piece was called Hershey. He did a piece called Rush for President. And um, 
and we had a transsexual serving these chocolate vaginas within a gallery setting. And it was for a show, the show was called Everybody In, I was bringing everybody together. These vaginal forms are very yin yang like with the little red, whatever you might call the steam in coming out. And um, I was probably one of the funnest shows I've ever had, was in because of people, it was all, so much interaction was in that show. So it was really great. A year and a half ago, I did Hershey, He, She, and for a show in the Netherlands. And we also have the chocolates made there. And we had a video going of the show that was performed at Rush Gallery. And we served uh, the penis heads and the vagina-like shapes uh, at the gallery, at the institution. And it was, you know, the Netherlands are a little more open than we are sexually. So it wasn't, so they just had fun with it. They loved it. And the chocolatier was incredible there. He made them beautifully. So moving along to work, um, I was in the process of making, uh, before the pandemic hit, uh, is uh, this piece that I've been doing for the last year, maybe even year and a half. And um, I'm using 63, I was using 63 pieces in it. I was creating with these coffins a pattern and a pattern that would, uh, at, when you first look at it, you wouldn't know they're coffins, but then when you look, you would see their coffins. And it was really a representation of my time, my life, and being on this planet of 63 years, but we're beyond that already. <laughs> so, and every, so they will all have, you know, where I am with it right now is in process. Uh, I was supposed to be on a show. They decided it was too big for their wall. So I had to make another piece. And um, they, uh, so every seven one will, the, they, so they all will have mirrors in it. Every seven one will be different. The mirror will be placed in there differently. Since a pandemic, I, I think very much about how, we're go, um, each, how we get through each day, how we get through each week. So in this, every seven year, you regenerate cells, so there's a new birth. Now I'm thinking about every week, so every seven day, months a week of getting through this pandemic. So the piece might change. It might move more into that, opposed to what I was doing, which has a similar uh, concept to it about permanent impermanence and how things change uh, constantly. And, you know, we are in a time that we notice uncertainty more than ever. So um, this is it. this piece is still in the works, and this piece I was doing. It's also still in the works and it uh, has drippings down. Uh, we'll have drippings, but I'm still working on it. The piece is called Not Forever and it was for a show um, at uh, Pen and Brush that was supposed to open in April. And now it's not opening until 2021. And from a curator, Bina uh, Sakar, she's in India and she has a publication, uh, Galleria International. Which I am featured in it, but I don't have a hard copy because I was supposed to get it in April when she came in. And uh, the show is on identity. It's a group show. And um, and when you, you know, when you look in, the, in this, you see how what appears is fading away and being covered by the drops, the dripping. And it talks about beauty and identity and uh, how and impermanence, so a aging, sickness, death. Um, it's it's interesting how it's so much a part of what we're living through right now, you, you know, in a very noticeable way. But being a Buddhist practitioner, uh, it's something that it's always practiced with us, and uh, so it's not something we avoid, like in. American culture. 
Now going to this series over here. This is a, a series called Evidence of Being. And this all started, I think in 2015 when I started archiving my career. I had a friend who passed away from brain cancer, an artist friend, and everything was in order. And my everything was not in order for me. And it prompted me to really archive everything and get everything ready. So when I do die, when that time comes, whoever's handling my work will have access to everything in a much more organized way. And um, as I was doing that, uh, I came across rejection letters. And over here, this piece is called Rebirth. And these are shredded rejection letters that are mixed in with gold leaf. Well, it starts with uh, the rejection letters, then they're mixed, and then there's uh, the gold leaf uh, alone. And that's, you know, it's a very optimistic piece um, on rejection. I have here a very tongue-in-cheek piece, a smaller version called Sugar and Spice. And then I made, um, oh God, 40 some odd envelopes. Uh, or 35 envelopes. Uh, I did an installation last uh, October, it was past October at Pin and Brush that was really beautifully installed. They gave me a great venue to have the work look really great. Um, and they're, uh, all these envelopes are made by hand. They're made to let you know at a museum board and archival paper, acrylic, resin, metal leaf, wax, and polyurethane. Uh, some have epoxy and some might have some fiberglass, uh, but the one you would see them on my website. And they're all named after a gallery that, uh, or institution that rejected me in my time, in my past. Uh, so let's see. So basically, uh, one of the things that Charlotte might want to go into now. I have been in Chelsea since 1986, so I'm really a pioneer. Uh, I was here with the drug dealers, the prostitutes, and factory workers. There were very few artists here, really. It, uh, they were scattered about. It wasn't like a community, like in Tribeca, because when I was looking then, Tribeca was a real community of artists and people knew each other. Um, so in 86 to 92, I actually was across the street from where I am now in a studio there. And then I moved to the meatpacking district, which was actually on, was on the Chelsea side. Uh, I was in the Apple store on the second floor, um, and I was there for two and a half years. And then I moved back here uh, 25, a little over 25 years ago. So I've been pretty much a staple in this neighborhood and I've seen the changes and in my series, Evidence of Being, there is Kelsey then and now that Charlotte thought she might show you, but, uh, and there's also pictures of me that she had. I, I am going to share that, Arlene. Thank you. Huh? I am going to, I am going to oh. share these incredible photos of Arlene in her first studio in Chelsea. Okay. Right across so, the street, right, Arlene? Yes. Yes. So this is, Arlene is a pioneer female welder in Chelsea in the mid 80s, right? Yes. You see me okay? Am I, uh, yes. am I at the right height? All right, great. Because I'm sitting down now. <laughs> so. so, oh, actually I could turn it around and uh, one second, give me a moment guys. I just want to... No, while, while you're doing that, I'm also going to... Uh, right. I, there, there was something else that I also wanted to share. Yeah. Um, I have to get back to it. But I just love seeing all the work in your studio so much, Arlene, that I, I don't want to interrupt with this, but this okay. is a, a, a photo of the rendering of the evidence of being. Right. Installation that she's preparing for spring break. So this is... Oh, you can talk about it. Oh, well, no, it was, uh, it was, you know, the show was in excess. And uh, this was a proposal that we did. Uh, actually, Kate, who might be there now, uh, was curating it. 
and um, and we were waitlisted, like probably a number of people, and didn't get in, like probably a number of people. <laughs> so, but uh, but <laughs> it's available <laughs> for some other place. <laughs> I wanted to just show this because I think you're thinking as far as you're making and then seeing these installations and we saw that little piece of it in your studio, but yes. to be aware that like, this is how Arlene envisions representing that in the end, yes. it's just a different conceptual piece. And we saw some of these on the wall um, yes. as well, but I just, I wanted to highlight a few of them um, just very briefly. And especially this one, which I had to do a shout out and a thank you for because she did, um, <laughs> donate it to the Pelham Arts Center to support mm -hmm. nonprofit arts, which was so glorious that we were able to get this into a collector's home uh, this past fall. So I had to say thank you for that. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. I did a similar piece uh, just to let you know for the spring break. It's not the same, but a similar. Okay. It doesn't have the on it that you said. <laughs> so, so are there any questions that you might uh, want to ask had, I have some questions from the chat, Arlene. And this one, this one seems very interesting. This was privately sent, so you can't see it. Um, but about your choice of materials and yes. the relationship with that and concept. And does it start with the concept and then figuring out the materials or do you sometimes fall in love with the material and have that lead to a concept? So, um, I, I usually start off with concepts. I, I am very, I love materials. As you can see, I work in all different materials. And uh, though I will say, um, which I don't know if you could pull up the piece, uh, Charlotte in Waiting, which is under sculptures and the figure is the glass lady. Okay. Uh, it might be good if they could see that because that piece started, uh, that piece was actually a piece that was first, uh, it's first conception because I rework some of my work at times. Um, and it was part of a, a series that was called Carnival, which is uh, deals with loss. I mean, because Carnival in Latin is removal of flesh. And I was doing like hospice work at the time and teaching uh, art to women with cancer. So, um, and my mother went through cancer twice. So what I was doing at that time, this was a different piece to begin with. And then, uh, and it was called Carnival. And then I decided to, uh, I sold the photograph that went with it because it was, uh, it had more, it was an installation piece. And I decided to rework the piece. And I saw glass in my friend's studio and I took the glass and I put it on the seat of that piece. And I thought about the fact that the piece is sitting there contemplative and waiting, which we're doing a lot of today because we're waiting for the virus to be over or we're waiting on lines. It's always waiting. Uh, in, particularly in New York, but um, I, that piece, uh, no, you could right. do a detailed shot of it, right? Yeah, that's what but I was Basically, thinking. I figured I would do the chair, just the stool, but then I was, uh, some friends were over and we were hanging out and they thought I was doing the entire piece and I said, oh no, and then I, they said, well, you have to, and I, um, I said, oh, I guess I do. So it took me almost a year. So each piece of glass is put on individually. And it was a very meditative uh, process for me to do that piece. And because of the material, so there I started with a concept. I found material, I used the material. Then I was hooked into the concept of what the material meant, the shattering of glass, things breaking apart, things shedding, things purifying. And, um, and I started using it in my twin series. I started using it in, with the heads, the concept of the head and the self and the shattering of the features. So um, 
it became, um, if you looked under heads, you could see one piece called self-portrait and it's with the glass head. I could show it to you here. I'm gonna get up and bring you with me to how that piece evolved also. So here we go. So this is a uh, self-portrait and it's also um, with the glass. And, um, and one of the things about this piece that you don't see it, the pedestal does light up. And uh, the other thing about it is there's double-sided pupils. So then when you look inside, on the other side, you see it looking inward. So, and as part, you know, that's definitely the concept of how we perceive, you know, I was dealing with perception and how we see things in life. So, um, so that's, um, to answer your question, it could, it could start with a material like even gold leafing is, there's a concept behind the material that I use a lot because gold creates value, you know, we think of it as something of value. So uh, is it possible to turn the self? Uh, what's that? Oh, the self-portrait head around to see the Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, uh, actually, I'll plug it in because you can see it better with the light on. So I'm just going to put this down and uh, let's see if I could do it correctly since my friend left already so let me just uh see if i could does it go on yeah and so we made the pedestal for this and i'll show you if now it's gonna be hard could you all right great so oh you can see it you see the eyeball you can see some of the as i go around it you can see the eyeballs ref looking the pupils looking in it's really so oh good <laughs> it's yeah. really it's really subtle um but you could see it and it's quite in person particularly and when you see it it's like oh whoa you know, this is looking at me. I forgot so. I was on the light up pedestal. That's a really yes. nice reminder about yeah. the lighting. Um, we're getting some other other questions about material. And you know, this kind of, this one goes back a little bit, but about switching from the abstract metal to the conceptual. And that's yes. to be a big turning point. And can you tell us more about it? Yes. Um, so, uh, I got out of school and I, in school, I worked mainly abstract. Um, and I did some conceptual work back then. Um, in the, this is the late seventies. Um, and I um, sort of took a break from doing art because I had no money after school and I w was supporting myself. So bottom line to all of it, I wound up getting, I moved into a, um, uh, the furniture industry and I was doing design work and, um, and working a lot with architecture. And when I started doing my work again, which was a few years after I went into that, I, um, I, I was commissioned to do abstract paintings from my client and I was also painting again, which you don't see my paintings, but um, I then, when I left to do my work full time, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I took a mixed media class and it wasn't really a class, it was at the Sculpture Center and a place to work so I could see what kind of, you know, studio I wanted to set up because I was working in wood before. And when I worked in wood, I worked organically and uh, structurally. Um, there, were, there were hard edges and, or, and curves. Uh, it was very mixed. Um, but at that time, I, uh, 
went up there and he asked me if I wanted to do stonework or if I wanted to do the welding and I didn't quite really want to do either but the welding looked more interesting and the people looked more interesting who were there so I started welding and it just I got hooked on it and you know when you're doing welding uh, it's, it, most of it is abstract. I don't know many welders that do figurative work because you're moving then into casting and maybe casting in steel. Um, but I started doing, um, and the influence from what I was doing prior, the architectural and the design work, I think was very much in my early work. So uh, that's, that's basically how it all started. The and you know, abstract, um, I, I just didn't find that it allowed me to speak my voice the way I wanted to speak it, and I, and I had to move out of it. I just wasn't doing, it sort of played out for me. I still do certain things, certain abstract things, uh, ink drawings and stuff that uh, I do privately, and I sell it privately. You know, some people see it in there. They usually want to buy it, but um, it's easier to, for me to sell, <laughs> but it's not what I really want to be doing. <laughs> so. That's, that's very interesting. I'm glad you <laughs> said that out loud. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Even with material Sigma too, Arlene, like going from that and all of your heads and the glass work and the figuratives and the resin, like the, the range of materials and mold making and these yeah elements is really pretty extraordinary when you start to add up all the technical aspects. aspects. Yes, and uh, so that was like quite interesting because I hadn't done figure to work for a really long time. Uh, it was not a big thing of mine, even in college. Uh, I don't think I did any figure to work except for some painting. Uh, and it was more, uh, no, I didn't do figure to work in at all. So I did it in high school. So I've done art my entire life, just to let you know, I don't remember not doing art and not being an artist. I, it just was something I always did. And I did sculpture since I could remember also, Play-Doh, Erectosets. Well, I was always building and uh, doing, you know, I like the physicality of working with materials. So, um, I start when I need when I had this vision of these heads. I went to get my head cast, and that was an experience that was pretty terrifying. <laughs> and I thought I was pretty cool because I meditate and oh, I'll relax. I'm relaxed. My heart was pounding with like it felt like it was going to go through my head when they were covering me with all this gook because you can't do it yourself. Um, they used alginate, so they take the head apart and they give me this head to finish. And the head had cracked the ear and the, it was like squished in on the side. I thought I was going to get something a lot more uh, usable. And I had to do the finishing work and I was like, I hadn't done figure to work in ages. So I was quite scared actually. I was like, how am I going to do this? So I took pictures of myself. I had a mirror and I took pictures of bald men. So I had the backs of heads and I sculpted the head and then I sculpted the eyes for an another mold. But when I brought it back to them, they were like really shocked because I asked them so many questions and they thought I didn't know what I was doing. And I really felt I didn't know what I was doing, but they liked what I did so much, they offered me a job <laughs> to work there. Um, but I had no clue, you know, it's like, you know, moving from the abstract to the figurative, it wasn't a smooth, um, it wasn't smooth, it wasn't a smooth journey for me. But if you want to do something and express yourself a certain way, you just you, you just take the step. I mean, even in the performance piece I did at Art in Odd Places, where I used audio and it was interactive. Um, and I, uh, people who don't know it, I did this piece in October, Art in Odd Places. I was on 14th Street and 7th Avenue and I decorated a phone booth with rejection letters and I had audio going on resounding all the rejections, typical rejections that I got. 
And then people came and brought rejection letters and we pinned them in and I gave out uh, wristbands that said evidence of being. And we recorded other people's stories about rejection and it made people feel very, um, uh, the show was uh, invisible and it made people feel very visible. And, uh, and that was the point of it, because when we do go through rejection, we get, we feel like we don't, you know, we don't matter, we don't exist, if we're not important enough, the work's not important enough, maybe I should pack it in now. And um, so I had to do video, audio, and that was also an interesting aspect and figure out technically how to do it in the streets of New York where I had to put it up and take it down each day because I couldn't leave it out there. So, you know, it's, all of that is a challenge. I have, I will say after a 30 some odd, I don't know, 20 some, 40 some odd career, whatever it is by now, I, I kind of, um, <laughs> I kind of rather someone else do some of it for me. It's like, uh, I have to learn this now. I have to learn that. Uh, how do I put this together? How do I install that? Um, but it does, I, I do think it keeps my mind fresh <laughs> and active. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, we got an inch. This is a great question about the baldness with the heads. And yes. speak and speak the appearance of genderless, but I know gender has a lot to do in your work. And yes. So can you speak about that? Yeah. Um, well, to address the uh, baldness and the androgynous part of the head, it, it's very much what I was saying earlier when I talked about it is that I wanted to bring together the male and female and make it into a human being. Uh, I, I felt that, you know, I was kind of fortunate, I was very fortunate in life, I was able to have the best of both worlds, going, growing up with a twin brother, and my parents uh, did not say, you had to do this, he's a boy, you're a girl, um, and the roles, like, you know, my father cooked and ironed my clothes for me, uh, my mother cooked and, you know, he did the laundry, she did the food shopping. I mean, we were all like, we just did what we were better at doing. It wasn't because of gender and roles. My mother worked, my father worked. Uh, so I was always, I grew up a certain way, but in life, I realized uh, being a woman and what it was about and how people responded to me was very different than how I grew up and how the world sees you. So. I, I felt it was more hopeful to strip what we hold so precious to us into uh, strip it away, which is the baldness, because here is uh, something we respond to greatly in our society. And uh, if you don't have hair, particularly as a woman, either you're sick or you have a disease or, or you might, or maybe you're gay, or, you know, whatever they might, you know, put you in certain categories. And I just wanted to take it all away and strip it down to a human being and to unite us. And that's what I did uh, with the heads. And, but I do talk about gender a lot, uh, socially, politically, uh, how we're seen in the art world. Uh, I talk about how the art world sees women. And of course, since my work is so much to do with current affairs, there's so much that comes out in society around how women are treated. Uh, all right, I know, yeah, I got a call that came in, sorry. So, um, so maybe, did, did I answer the question to the person's satisfaction or did they have more to ask me about it? I, I, I think you answered it wonderfully myself um you know what we do we have about 15 minutes or so left of this i'm i just put myself on gallery view for a minute to see who's here and if there are some people that would like to wave and kind of wave at me or unmute yourself oh my gosh there are a lot okay i see a lot of people <laughs> um let's let's go camille camille yes. susan janie 
Yay, Camille. <laughs> Are you asking a question, Camille? No, you just asked if anybody wanted to wave. I'll wave too. Oh, I'm sorry. I was I was confused. <laughs> Not just waving. Waving is fun, but what I meant is if you had a question <laughs> for Arlene. Oh no. <laughs> We're just waving. <laughs> it was very funny, Charlotte. Oh, that was my mistake in my rhetoric. I apologize. <laughs> um, but if anyone had any particular questions that they'd like more clarification on or comments. Oh, yes. Barbara, please go ahead. Hi, um, <clears throat> hi, Arlene. Nice meeting you finally. That was really wonderful. Thank you oh, so yeah. much. Oh, you're so welcome, Barbara. Yes, really great. So, you know, now that we're older, yes. um, I, I wonder for you, because you talk a lot about age, you talk about death, yes. and I wonder how that affects your work and moving forward. Like, yes. what is, how did that influence you? So, um, okay. So it's very much in, uh, influences, actually, the series that I was working on and the piece that I was doing for Pen and Brush and the piece that I, uh, with the coffins and there's more pieces were, it's part of my series called uh, My Body as a Battleground. And, uh, and it's something that, you know, I want to talk about and do talk about in my work, but I'm being older. I'm thinking a lot about my career, my my body falling apart, my the aging, and how society looks at you, and in many ways. And um, and my Buddhist practice has a lot to say about it, also. So um, I also had cancer, so I did work on that which is uh, in the series of my body as a battleground, but that was nine years ago, but I'm actually doing more uh, work on that. I've had many surgeries, so I'm doing things on my scars, you know, pieces on my scars. So it's, um, it's very influential in my work, but it's something I want to talk about in a way that, uh, in a, in a, in, a positive note, not in uh, a negative, like, so I'm getting older and I have these wrinkles and I don't look as good. No, I have these wrinkles and I have, uh, what's the word, uh, scars that make me uh, who I am and that's a good thing. It's like a good bottle of red wine, not a bad bottle, you know, not that ages with time. So I want to talk about it that way. I also want to talk about it in terms of we avoid it in our, in our culture. And we try do everything possible not to age, not to show people we're sick, not to get sick. And um, so I want to bring that to the forefront and have a dialogue about it and have a recognition that this happens. We're, we're all in this together. <laughs> you know, it's very air and we're all, you know, we come into this life and the minute we come in, we're aging. And, and we're dying and, and cells die every seven years and rejuvenate, you know, so it's a process and it's something that I am dealing with accepting on myself. So I, it's something that I am, you know, it's, it's part of my mind quite a bit, my thinking and looking and. Thank you. Thank you, Arlene. Um, yeah, I, I think it is so interesting. And what you mentioned about your friend who passed away that made you want to archive all of your art, that's really important too. And when I think about your portrait heads and like the transitional element of those, even like there were some that had the steel element and then had the head element and had these specific installations. Um, well, that was actually just thinking about the heads and the steel going together. Right. But the coffins and like the death of America and this bigger political thing that you're also speaking about. Yes. While thinking about like, I don't, I don't know anyone who's been through more medically or physically like surgery wise than you. And to be <laughs> like still doing it like so like I'm an artist, I'm doing this, this is my material, I don't care, this is my message, I'm not giving up and I'm doing it. Like, that's so beautiful to me and that like story of like um perseverance 
um, yes. especially as a, as a female, as a female artist, um, and then staying true to your message. I think it's really awesome. Um, Thank you, Charlotte. And Charlotte, you, you know, you, you walked me to uh, a restaurant when I barely could walk after an art fair. And I'll never forget that. Uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, I have gone through a lot of surgeries. <laughs> But I'm still here. <laughs> so thank you. Does anyone else? And at this point, like, if you wanna, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question or add a comment, yes, Janie, make sure you unmute yourself, or I'll unmute you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You Hi, um, Arlene. Um, can you address the fact that your objects are so beautiful, but they're addressing very difficult topics yes. that are in contrast to that? Yes. So uh, that's th thank you for uh, yeah. Your work is very beautiful. So you, uh, it's interesting is coming from you because your work is so beautiful. So I yeah. So you would pick up on that. And yes, I have an aesthetic, and uh, and I haven't lost that. You know, I, I care about the work, how it's executed tremendously. Uh, I have an assistant that works with me. I'm always telling him, no, that's not good enough. You know, I, aesthetic matters to me. Craftsmanship matters to me. It's, it, it's very important in my work. And, um, and I, just because I'm talking about something that my, be heavy or dark, uh, it still could be beautiful on a visual level. And I don't take that, you know, I don't separate the two. It could, it could happen simultaneously. It's also, you know, probably on a philosophical level, nothing is inherently one way anyhow. So in life, and it's like, you like chocolate, I like vanilla. Uh, nobody says chocolate's bad or nobody says vanilla's bad. So, you know, I, I think it, it might even come from that. But I, you know, maybe it's also where I came from in school. I mean, aesthetics were uh, part of what I learned and thought about. So, and I am extremely visual person. Uh, I think most artists are, but some more maybe than others. You know, I see detail, all detail. <laughs> It's like a, it's like a hindrance at times. <laughs> Time to stop, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Sally, I see you have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, Hi, Sally. your work's clearly it's very feminist, but yeah. it, more than that. Um, and I just wondered sometimes. Sorry. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, um, you know, it, it seems to go from the specific to more general, but um. I just, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm formulating this as I'm talking. Okay. Um, I wonder what some of your inspirations are. If, if some are positive, it's like, you know, you're inspired by good things that have happened and also by bad things, rejections, things like that. I wonder how that balances out for you and, and how it plays out in the larger scheme of things. In, in terms of my work or in terms of just me? Uh, both, both. So I think how it plays out in my work is maybe even what Janie said, you know, the work has aesthetic uh, to it. Uh, I, I do see silver linings in things, which I'm very lucky I do because I've been through a lot. And if I didn't, I probably would not be sitting here. So I, I have this ability to see uh, not only one side to things, you know, it's just um, the and I, I feel extremely fortunate that I can. I mean, right now what we're going through at times is just so painful and I don't see uh, any silver lining, but I do know change is what we need, and this will promote change. What we're going, what's happening in the world, uh, as difficult as it is to go through, you know, we're not human beings that are here to be isolated. You know, to isolate—that's not how we survive, and that alone 
besides the whole gamut of what this pandemic is creating is a, a difficult thing for me and many people to be going through. Yet I, at the beginning, I saw it more hopeful now that I'm living it. It's more challenging, but it, it, it does, it does have movement in a positive way to, you know, also I could get into, you know, well, I have glimmer of peace. Well, I'm really fortunate. Yes, I have my studio two and a half blocks away, even, you know, like how lucky can one be, you know, as an artist, uh, even though I don't feel like working. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't matter. I have it. I have, you know. Yeah, I just, I'd like to say particularly that glass figure really sticks with me that, I mean, I think it's such an important piece. Um, and it's transcendent. You know, some of your work is very issue oriented, but um, also I just like the way that it leaps from personal to more global. And it's very important uh, that my work does go, you know, leaps to global because, all, you know, I, I think all work comes from a person. So it's always going to be personal. I don't care, you know, it's abstract. It, it all has a personal aspect to it as, because it's coming from me. Though I think about bigger pictures than just me, you know, it's, and, but I also see myself very connected to other human beings because I'm human. So if it's happening with me, if I'm feeling this way, it's happening for other people also. It's just not only me. And so I want to connect from the place of the way more about what I talk about, even on a political. It's a, it's a cultural. It's a, we're all going through this. Um, you know, I didn't always look at politics. Uh, or maybe I did, and I saw all these white men in the same suit, and I couldn't have any relationship to what that was about. And then, you know, 2008, I, well, 2001, no, 20, 2000, when the Bush Gore election, that's when I started really getting more involved with politics and thinking politically. And 2008, I did my first piece. And then all we needed was this Trump's election for a lot of material. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of material. <laughs> Um, I see Paula had a question as well. Oh, and then Valerie. Paula and then Valerie. Okay, it's unmuted. Hi. Hi, hi Arlene. Hi. hi, hi, hi. It's been a while. I want to just thank you and applaud you on your voice. You have shared so many pieces of your life publicly that have been an inspiration to us ladies. You know, I, I, I've almost died a couple times. Lots of surgeries, lots of, lots of oopsies, as my son says, lots of oopsies. And your energy and your positiveness and finding the light in the darkness is an incredible inspiration. Thank you. That's what I wanted to say. Well, and I, Paula, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, cry. <laughs> so everybody want to see me cry <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. But Valerie, okay you have a question go ahead hi hi oh wait is that me am i uh, on here you are hey honey <laughs> hi. Hi. Hi, hi honey i just want to say what a wonderful talk you just gave but the thing that really stuck to me was how many different things you try and how you excel at so many of them. I'm going to cry for you too. <laughs> I mean, it's so important to support each other, but yeah. also as a person who loves detail too. And yes, you do. Even when I'm painting something that's not traditionally beautiful, that your work speaks to me and I'm really impressed with the high craftsmanship because that's also important to me. You I don't know. just have something to say. You want to make sure you say it and it's beautiful and it's eye-catching, like those gold leaf envelopes with rejection. I mean, uh, every time I've seen your work, I've been lucky enough to be in your studio and I've seen it at some art fairs and stuff. I'm always impressed by the high level of craftsmanship, not just something to say, but you're going to say it and it's going to be done really well. Anyway, congratulations. It was good to hear more about your practice. Thank you so much. Oh, don't 
cry. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I'll just cry a little bit. <laughs> I needed a good cry. <laughs> Who would have known this would have created <laughs> Bravo, bravo. Who said it was emotional? I know. <laughs> came up with that. And um, I just want to say, you know, it's interesting. I think about craftsmanship. Camila Skell is in, you know, shares a stu part of a studio with me here. And her, her work also has like such craftsmanship that, uh, and we went to school together. So it's, it's kind of interesting. I think about that, you know. Her. I didn't know you two went to school together. Yes. We go, we go back to college. Yes. I, I can't believe I'm just learning that right now. I yes. have no idea. Wow. Mm -hmm. oh, thank yes. you, someone. <laughs> um, yeah, I have to share. Um, I have to share one of my Arlene Rush pieces over here. Um, <laughs> I just when she started doing the envelopes, I was like, "Oh my God, Arlene, the envelopes are amazing! What is this material on here? The leafing, mm -hmm. like, I, I kind of like, I, I really loved it as well." Um, but what I also love is that Arlene also always gives back. So this was a piece she did to support the Palm Arts Center for our studio cafe in 2018. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I was lucky enough to get it. It was my first choice and I was like, oh mine, I'm gonna take that one home. So I see some <laughs> of my board members on here as well. You wanna show them the pictures when I first started welding or not? Yeah, I thought we, I did share those earlier. Oh, did you? I didn't see. I did. I, oh, the camera was flipped. Now I see. I didn't oh, see before. Yeah. I only saw myself. All right, I see it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this Thank is you, really, really so beautiful. Um, I don't want to go too over because uh, we've been on this. So if any, I'm going to take a last call for questions or comments. I just want to say thank you. Hi, this is Shanae. Oh, hey, practice. oh my gosh, this was amazing. Thank, oh, you. thank you. Absolutely amazing. I'm happy that I made it on. I, I am too. This is great. Thank you for coming. Wonderful to hear your voice. Thank you. How you doing, Charlie? I'm doing all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, this is wonderful. So thank you. And please thank continue you. to do what you are doing. It is wanted and needed. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm. <laughs> I see another. Kate, did you want to add something? Oh, no, I just want to say thank you. Hi, honey. I, I, I really think it's so important. And I think like for us as artists also, Charlotte connecting us and letting us see the work that's happening, you know, why we're so isolated, it really is motivating. And it's, it's really, I don't, it's so important. Like, Arlena has always been someone who's like, she does such important work, you know, and I think that that's like, I feel like crying too. <laughs> it's, I, I think that, it's, you know, tremendously like to what's going on in the world and keeps track of, um, of all, you know, very important things. So I'm, I'm grateful for you and your work, Arlene. Thank you. And I'm grateful for you and your support too. <laughs> <laughs> it's very cool to see so many artists um on here as well and it's it's mm -hmm. very cool um in general yeah. arlene i think we're going to be out of time so do you have any closing closing I, statements? yeah i just really want to say to everybody um first i want to thank you for coming and i really want i i wish you all the best during these times, uh, you know, to be safe, to be kind, to, to get through this where, you know, it's, I know how difficult it is. And I just hope that, you know, we all could get through this the best way we possibly can. And uh, anybody could reach out to me for any uh, encouragement. <laughs> I'd love to do that if I can. And Charlotte, thank you so much always for your support. We have a long friendship and uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Arlene. This, this was just really, really beautiful. Um, as I said at the beginning of this studio visit, I've just been enjoying these so much and I'm so grateful, well, obviously for artists and for artists that want to share their story and their journey. And this has been such a great series that we've been doing. 
Um, I also have to do an advertisement for next week's studio visit. <laughs> Yay! Tuesday, <laughs> Tuesday, we're going to see the studio of uh, Sarah McKenzie. And on Thursday, we're going to see the studio of Samson Constapasis. And next Friday, we'll be visiting Charles Clary in his studio. Um, I think they all make some really cool stuff. And um, if you want to join us for more of these, we're going to do them. We're just going to keep doing them. Um, so that's what we're doing. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, uh, everyone. Keep creating. Thank you so <laughs> much, everybody. Thank you, Charlotte. Make art, enjoy art. <laughs> So, thank you, so nice Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Arlene. Thank you, Karen. Hi, Karen. Oh. <laughs> hey. Nice having you. Thank you. I, I think my nephew's you. there. Is my nephew there? My nephew was supposed to come. Is he there? Jordan, uh -oh. are you there? I, didn't, I don't. I. I think he may have gone off. All right. I'm you gonna say hello. I know. My nephew, what can I tell you? Oh, <laughs> okay, nice. All right, I'm going to hang up for everybody. All right, bye. 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 Love you all. Love you too. Bye.